On October the 7th, 1994, Sarah McClendon, the senior White House news correspondent who has covered 11 presidential administrations, beginning with that of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, demonstrated once again that she has the courage to ask the hardball questions other journalists only dare to think. As she confronted William Jefferson Clinton about the Central Intelligence Agency's involvement in nefarious activities, activities set at a remote airport in western Arkansas while Clinton was Arkansas's commander-in-chief, she finally cornered the man who was a co-conspirator in bypassing the Constitution of the United States of America. In doing so, the president was not only forced to address the looming scandal that may impeach him, Clinton once again demonstrated his trademark talent. He lied. Sir, uh, the Republicans are trying to blame you for the existence of a small air base at Mena, Arkansas. This base was set up by George Bush and Oliver North and uh, the CIA to help the Iran Contras, and they brought in plane load after plane load of cocaine there for sale in the United States. And then they took the money and bought weapons and took them back to the Contras, all of which was illegal, as you know, under the Bolin Act. But tell me, did they tell you that this had to be in existence because of national security? Well, let me answer the question. No, they didn't tell me anything about it. They didn't say anything to me about it. The airport in question and all the events in question were the subject of state and federal inquiries. It was pri primarily a, a matter for federal jurisdiction. The state really had next to nothing to do with it. The local prosecutor did conduct an investigation based on what was within the jurisdiction of state law. The rest of it was under jurisdiction of the United States attorneys who were appointed successively by previous administrations. We had nothing, zero, to do with it, and everybody who's ever looked into it knows that. Polk County Prosecutor Charles Blake, the man who initially attempted to investigate the MENA Arkansas criminal activities, would surely take exception to Mr. Clinton's assertion that, quote, the local prosecutor did conduct an investigation based on what was within the jurisdiction of the state law, end quote. In fact, it was Blake who went directly to then-Governor Clinton to seek funding for his investigation, seeing as how rural Polk County lacked the financial resources to deal with the CIA. When it became apparent that uh, nothing was going to be done on the federal level, that's when I began more actively pursuing it. Prosecutor Black, a Clinton supporter, met with the governor and handed him a letter requesting money for a state grand jury on MENA. His response to me was that he would uh, uh, get a man, something to the effect that he would get a man on it and would get word back to me. And uh, I never heard back. Years later, Clinton said he offered $25,000 to Prosecutor Black's boss to fund a grand jury. But Charles Black and his boss claim they never heard about any offer of money from Governor Clinton. I believe Bill Clinton's an honest, respectable man, and I have to believe that he did that. But the fact is, I never got that word myself. Black wasn't the only man affected by uncooperative superiors who, for some strange reason, seemed willing to turn a blind eye to blatant disregard for America's laws. William Duncan, a senior IRS Criminal Intelligence Division investigator, was running headlong into invisible walls that were protecting what appeared to be an open wound in the Department of Justice. How far will the United States government go to protect an operation? Will they kill a case? I think history has shown that that can happen. Did it happen? In my opinion, yes. Duncan, through the Arkansas Attorney General's office, desperately sought funding to continue his investigation into the dark corners of the CIA's activities in Arkansas. But just as Prosecutor Blake had earlier experienced, Bill Clinton wouldn't help. The purse strings funding justice were drawn tight. So Clinton's response to Sarah McClendon about, quote, the state really had next to nothing to do with it, end quote, was another lie. The state, under Clinton's control, helped seal the fate of the MENA scandal by not funding a proper investigation. Even more shocking, when law enforcement failed to shield the citizens of Arkansas from the federal government's reckless disregard for the sovereignty of the state and its laws, a citizens group known as the Arkansas Committee, gathered thousands of signatures and went directly to Clinton, demanding he lead the investigation. 
The results of the civilian effort? Continued lies, deceit, and cover-up. What forces could be responsible for compromising the entire system of justice? Bill Clinton certainly knows. He was the governor of Arkansas who allowed the subversion of his state government by the shadowy forces radiating from the Reagan Bush White House when ex-CIA director William Casey began using the CIA to illegally conduct secret foreign policy. This serious breach of America's constitutional authority was labeled by the media as Iran-Contra. This documentary will rewrite this dark period in American history and leave you with a gnawing question. Who or what is running this country? Gun running. Mysterious CIA flights. Contra military training. Guerrilla pilot training. Clandestine airdrops. Tons of illegal drugs. Millions of dollars in dirty money. Covert activity in some third world banana republic, right? Wrong. Arkansas, America's own banana republic. The cost of, uh, of living an exciting life is high. Uh, you can't sit in Baton Rouge and uh, go to work from 9 to 5 on Monday through Friday and go to the LSU football games on Saturday night and church on Sunday morning and have an exciting life. That may be exciting to 99% of the population, but to me it's not. And the exciting thing in life to me is to get into a life-threatening situation. Now, that's excitement. That was the voice of the late Adler Berryman Seal, pilot extraordinaire, soldier of fortune, drug smuggler, undercover agent for the FBI, DEA, U.S. Customs, and the Central Intelligence Agency. Barry Seal, who was ruthlessly assassinated in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in February 1986, plays a pivotal role, along with a C-123K military transport plane he affectionately named the Fat Lady, in chronicling the true history of Iran-Contra. This story is about unmasking the deception that was perpetuated upon the American people at a time in the mid-1980s when a small backward state, Arkansas, became the epicenter of a CIA-like operation designed to do an end run around congressional law. A blank operation being backdoored out of the Reagan-Bush White House and set in place in rural western Arkansas under the watchful eyes of then-Governor William Jefferson Clinton. We will expose the ongoing cover-up, which has now spanned three presidential administrations, a cover-up designed to keep the American people in the dark about the unthinkable that trafficking in cocaine is justified in the pursuit of national security and foreign policy. This documentary is presented from two unique perspectives, from the outside through the eyes of numerous journalists, news organizations, and researchers constituting more than an eight-year effort to get to the truth surrounding the CIA's use of Western Arkansas as a staging area for deniable covert activities. And told from the inside through a man who survived the MENA connection and who now, at great personal risk, is willing to set the record straight about the inner workings of the CIA's off-the-shelf, self-sustaining, standalone project known as the Enterprise. This intelligence insider, Terry Reed, has written a best-selling book, Compromised, Clinton, Bush, and the CIA detailing the inner workings of Ronald Reagan's backdoor foreign policy, mislabeled Iran-Contra by the media. Terry will join us later in this documentary to lead us through this maze of deceit that was the brainchild of George Herbert Walker Bush and which compromised Bill Clinton. So what were Barry Seal's CIA-assigned tasks at MENA? First, the Contras needed guns. Arkansas's National Guard armories had most of the component parts and in inventory from which to build guns. All that was lacking was to enlist the manufacturing services of a small clandestine group of trusted Arkansas manufacturing companies, and the recipe would be complete. 
they would build the critical gun parts that, by law, produce a paper trail from the manufacturer to the end user. Only in this case, per CIA instructions, there would be no serial number stamped into the parts and no documentation created to leave an embarrassing trail. Untraceable weapons would seemingly appear from nowhere, and Barry Seal would then fly the munitions to staging areas in Central America with the help of his CIA-provided C-123 cargo plane, the Fat Lady, which had a gross weight capability of 60,000 pounds. Second, the Contras needed skilled pilots, pilots trained in the risky and often deadly business of flying slow and heavily laden cargo planes behind enemy lines for the purpose of resupplying the Contra soldiers on the ground in Nicaragua. As we had learned in Vietnam, guerrilla warfare depends upon a continuous supply of munitions, medical supplies, and food being provided to the foot soldier on the ground. The CIA's Enterprise, based in Honduras, had already procured the planes, planes such as the C-123 Provider and the C-7 Caribou. But potentially catastrophic risks were being taken by piloting the planes with American crews. If an accident or a shootdown did occur, the CIA would have built-in deniability if the planes were piloted by Nicaraguan nationals who were simply trying to liberate their country from the jaws of communism. Being an FAA certified flight instructor, Terry Reed's role with respect to the Contra pilot training was to train the students in multi-engine low-level operations, giving special emphasis to aerial cargo delivery techniques at night while in hostile fire environments. Third, SEAL was tasked with flying the necessary cash back to Arkansas to sustain the operation. All of the sources of SEAL's cash are not yet known. However, a large amount has been traced to the Drug Enforcement Administration in Florida. It appears the DEA was funding the MENA operation with cash seized during drug raids. Were there Contras who relied on the profits of narcotics in order to buy arms and to survive? Yes. It is easy to see how the entire MENA enterprise could evolve into ex-CIA Director Bill Casey's mandate to develop an off-the-shelf self-sustaining, standalone entity that could perform certain activities on behalf of the United States. But what developed as a result of Barry Seal building the machinery to launder unauthorized government money will likely emerge as a money laundering scandal, the likes of which this country has never seen. Back in the summer of 1987, a young television journalist named Teresa Dickey was covering Western Arkansas for Channel 5 out of Fort Smith, a city located 100 miles north of Mena. Well, Miss Dickey had discovered something very strange indeed was, or had been, going on in and around the Mena airport. Years earlier, the townspeople of Mena had welcomed with open arms and much fanfare the arrival of huge military C-130 aircraft. This was perceived as a boom for the rural Mena economy. Little did the townspeople realize, the Central Intelligence Agency had just selected MENA as the staging area for an unauthorized clandestine operation. Initially, Dickey thought that perhaps she was witnessing the results of then-Governor Bill Clinton's aggressive industry recruitment program, a recruitment program designed to drag Arkansas beyond its hillbilly, corncob pipe, and moonshine image by luring out-of-state businesses into Arkansas through promises of state-backed low-interest loans, nearly free land and buildings, coupled with huge tax incentives. Jobs for Arkansans was the young governor's pledge, and Dickey, at first, thought maybe Clinton's plan was working. Bill Clinton's industry recruitment plan had worked all right. Its purpose was to attract industry. But what it had attracted and recruited was the CIA, and along with it, covert operations which had been banned by the United States Congress. But what was peculiar about the MENA airport was the level of sophistication found in all sorts of aircraft maintenance operations situated alongside MENA's single north-south runway. Not to mention that remote MENA was the home of only 5,000 people. High-tech aircraft overhaul facilities located deep in a densely wooded region of the Washita mountain range Businesses drawing from a labor pool not normally associated with skilled technicians, well, 
All of this made Dickie suspicious. So what had Dickie found in that isolated little burg known as Mina, Arkansas? A town with no four-lane highway access. A town where everyone either knew each other or was related. A town that was harboring a deep, dark secret. The aftermath of a large-scale CIA-like operation that was soon to have a very bright light shown upon it. What had triggered Dickey's suspicion was the extensive security barring access to the airport, as well as the presence of a sea of very large airplanes. Airplanes bearing new paint jobs, foreign registrations, and markings from cities situated long distances from tiny Mina. This prompted her to interview a series of individuals who owned or operated aircraft modification and overhaul facilities at the Mina airport. Dickey focused immediately on why the need for such elaborate security, which included the use of employee ID badges. George Reeb, the owner of a shop that had retrofitted CIA aircraft, responded as follows. Well, you have to tighten up security whenever you're around aircraft because of the uh, safety factor. And I think it's a good idea because, you know, since we're growing so fast, a lot of times you're not familiar with all your employees and to have badges you can distinguish who's an employee and who's an employee for another company on the field versus just someone coming in to look around and you can't quite have that when asked why he had relocated to Mina from Maryland Reeb responded well I worked for Fokker aircraft at the time and was handling used aircraft and one of the customers told me about Mina, Arkansas, to have aircraft refurbished, and I'd never heard of Mina, Arkansas before. Dickey inquired about Mina's customer base, and Reeb provided. Had an airplane last week, leave for Australia. One, two weeks prior to that to Australia, we have two more coming that are going to Australia. We send uh, aircraft to Europe, uh, all over the world. Reeb's response about refurbishing aircraft from as far away as Australia should have alerted Dickey that something was amiss. The operating cost to fly a large airplane from Australia to Mina would far exceed any savings realized by having work performed in rural Arkansas. Dickey was then able to penetrate the security of Rich Mountain Aviation, the CIA's primary facility at Mina, the very one that had been used by Barry Seal's organization. Dickey was able to film both Fred Hampton Jr. and Joseph Neville Evans, Seal's trusted mechanics, both of whom were assets of the CIA and DEA. Dickey then interviewed Fred Hampton, and again, the discussion centered on the need for elaborate security. Well, the security fence, well, that was something we put up probably about uh, two or three weeks ago. We put it up in anticipation of our first uh, inspection by the military. Being that these are their aircraft and they are used as part of this uh, missile defense system in the Marshall Islands. This was obviously a cover story. Dickey would later discover that office employees of Rich Mountain had been asked to believe concocted cover stories as well. This went as far as one secretary being told that one of Barry Seal's planes had been modified to haul porpoises. Dickey's suspicions solidified into reality a few months later. Through the Iran-Contra hearings in Washington, a connection had been made between the Contras and the MENA operation. This prompted Dickey to dig back into the history of the government's clandestine involvement with Rich Mountain Aviation, a company that was surfacing as one that had performed strange modifications to CIA aircraft. A central figure was also emerging, a man named... Adler Berryman Seal. This is Barry Seal, a highly publicized drug smuggler originally operating out of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Since 1978, he carried out one of the largest drug smuggling operations between the United States and Central America. In the spring of 1982, Louisiana State Police warned Seal that they would tail him wherever he went in efforts to stop his operation. It's believed that Seal decided to move his operation out of that state after the warning. It was here at Rich Mountain Aviation that authorities believed Barry Seal moved his operation. 
Terry Capehart owned a business at the Mina Airport, and he remembers when he first met Barry Seal in 1981. Of course, I didn't know who Barry Seal was. I'd never heard of the man. And uh, Freddie introduced me to him. Capehart didn't know of Seal's drug background then, but remembers that this man, Joe Evans, former partner of Freddie Hampton's, brought in one of Seal's planes to Rich Mountain Aviation. Evans declined to comment for TV5 News, saying it's his policy to, quote, keep quiet, unquote. Capehart said he began to see more and more of Barry Seal, especially after the spring of 1982. He didn't suspect anything until the Polk County Sheriff called him in with some troubling information. I came uh, in possession of some information that indicated some aircraft being serviced and stored on the uh, airport here was being used in an illegal international operation. Capehart then began noticing some alterations to Barry Seal's aircraft that he says are common to drug smugglers. That I seen myself, uh, Freddie and Dwayne Hill, which was an employee of Rich Mountain Aviation, changed the end number on one of the airplanes so that they were both identical. And then that aircraft made a flight. If they got caught or somebody was on them or turned the end number in, they can just take the tape, yank it off the airplane. The airplane's set, say, in, in Florida or Louisiana, wherever. DEA or, or an agency comes up and asks about it, they'll say, hey, this is not the end number. That airplane's sitting in Mean, Arkansas, inside the hangar. A former employee of Rich Mountain Aviation also saw unusual modifications and was given far-fetched reasons for them. What Joe had told me that it was going to be used to transport porpoises on. And he, the other guy just kind of looked at Joe and said, that's a good one. Well, Former Sheriff Hadaway says he had plenty of evidence to prove a conspiracy, but in 1984, Seal became an informant for the Federal Drug Enforcement Agency. It was then that the sheriff was told to halt his investigation into Seal and Rich Mountain Aviation. Two years later, Seal was murdered by Colombian hitmen for his role as an informant. The grand jury is expected to look into the activities of Barry Seal at Mina Airport prior to 1984. Local investigators believe they have a strong case, but have wondered why it's taken so long to come to court. Tomorrow night, we'll show how the covert smuggling of arms to Contra rebels in Nicaragua may have slowed down one aspect of drug investigations by local authorities. As Nikki just noted, her investigation was now turning up evidence that Mina had been a staging area for arms shipments to Central America. Isn't it interesting that a freshman journalist like Dickey was already making the Mina connection? As the Iran-Contra hearing in Washington raged on, the teams of seasoned federal investigators should have been following Dickey because she had also made the Fat Lady connection as well. To smuggle arms to Nicaragua from the Mina airport required not only a skilled pilot like Barry Seal, but also a large military transport plane. Dickey had learned that Barry Seal's CIA-provided C-123K military cargo plane had been based at Rich Mountain Aviation, and this caused her to file part two of her series. This man, the late Barry Seal, was a known drug smuggler whom authorities believed moved his drug smuggling base of operation from Baton Rouge, Louisiana to Mena, Arkansas in 1982. In 1984, he parked this plane at Rich Mountain Aviation at Mena's airport. I know that one time um, Mr. Seals was working in it and he had some ropes around it and we were instructed not to go near the plane while Mr. Seals was in there working was informed that this aircraft had been used to smuggle some cocaine into the United States. Then, subsequent to that, some information that it may have been used to, uh, in an operation that was used to embarrass the Nicaraguan government. With this information, the former sheriff sought a court order to confiscate the plane in June of 1984. Everything was lined up, but then he received a telephone call from a drug enforcement agency supervisor from Miami named Robert Jara. He finally disclosed to me and asked me not to uh, confiscate the airplane, told me that if I did, that I would just be ordered to give it back to him, that in fact the DEA did have a large financial interest in the aircraft. At this point, Hadaway's investigation into Barry Seal's drug smuggling activities at Rich Mountain Aviation came to a screeching halt. 
Six months later, Seal's plane left Mina. The next time the sheriff heard about it, it had crashed in Nicaragua during a gun-running mission to the Contra rebels. Hadaway's run-in with the DEA would have gone unnoticed, except for an April 1987 broadcast on CBS's West 57th Street called The CIA Connection, Drugs for Guns. Do you really believe the government decided to get into the drug business in order to pay for the Contra? The American government. Uh, as incredulous as it may sound, I, I believe that not only decided to get into it, I think they orchestrated the whole thing. I need more on that. Bring it up a bit. Go ahead. There you go. These two Fort Smith men saw the story and were discussing it in a local bar. An assistant U.S. attorney overheard their conversation and told him his office was working on a case just like that. He mentioned that their office had a case and that in the process of that they had contacted some people in Florida for some assistance and that another agency in Florida had contacted their office and told them to drop the case to get off of it. It bothers me to think that a competent attorney's office could be restrained from doing its job. It's, uh, that's what bothers me. These men also say the attorney said the case in question involved very seal activities in the MENA area. The Congressional Subcommittee on Crime has now begun its own investigation into the MENA connection. Tomorrow night, we'll show you how a probe into a money laundering scheme in MENA seems to have gone nowhere. Drugs, guns, money laundering, cover-up. The CIA's MENA connection appeared to be reaching critical mass. A federal grand jury was preparing to expose the whole seedy affair. Dickey was following a trail she probably thought would lead to a Pulitzer Prize in investigative journalism. Here she was in rural western Arkansas, covering a federal grand jury proceeding that was destined to prove that the CIA had not only violated congressional law by shipping arms to the Contras, but had also allowed their black operations aircraft to transport cocaine into the United States. The issue of a drug smuggling conspiracy revolves around this convicted drug smuggler, the late Barry Seal. Former SEAL pilots spoke at a grand jury this week about whether their former boss had moved his operation from Baton Rouge, Louisiana to Rich Mountain Aviation in Mena, Arkansas. One pilot who testified told TV5 News Rich Mountain Aviation was simply used by Barry SEAL and SEAL didn't involve the company in his drug smuggling activities. But a couple years ago, other witnesses testified at a grand jury about another possible aspect of this conspiracy, money laundering and nothing happened. Catherine Gann used to work as a secretary for Freddie Hampton of Rich Mountain Aviation. She says she handled lots of cash for her boss, but sometimes in an extraordinary manner. I was told to deposit the large amounts of cash in uh, amounts of less than $10,000. Even if we had fifteen or $20,000, I would go to two separate banks and deposit um, less than 10,000 at one bank and less than 10,000 at another. What she's talking about is money laundering or structuring deposits to avoid filling out one of these internal revenue service forms called a currency transaction report. I asked Fred Hampton why he wanted me to deposit it this way and he said IRS won't get this, we won't have to pay taxes on it. Union Bank of Mina is one of the banks that Kathy Gann was told to deposit large amounts of cash. One Union Bank employee told TV5 News that on one occasion, a former bank official divided the cash for Rich Mountain Aviation and personally went to different tellers and had each of them deposit $10,000 into the Rich Mountain Aviation account. Catherine Gann gave testimony to an IRS agent about the illegal practice, but found that when she appeared before a grand jury, it asked no questions about the money laundering. When I left there, I was wondering, as I walked down the hall, I wondered, well, why did they bring me up here? In the meantime, the fact that she gave testimony has caused her to live in fear. I, I kept waiting and waiting to hear from somebody, and I was scared all this time. I didn't know what was going to happen to me, and, you know, I knew that that his truck had been outside my house. I was scared for my girls. People close to this issue wonder why such a cut and dried case failed to produce indictments. 
The former Polk County the, Sheriff the has lost faith in the process of justice. The, really have, uh, do not have a great deal of confidence in, in the function of the federal criminal justice system at this time. But even if this grand jury fails to produce any indictments, other law enforcement officials say they will continue their separate investigations. In Nina, I'm Teresa Dickey reporting for the news people. You are probably wondering, how many indictments did the Fort Smith grand jury hand up? Answer, none. But Dickey noted that several other law enforcement officials were committed to continuing their investigations into the MENA connection if the grand jury bore no fruit and investigate they did. In fact, their efforts triggered the interest of out-of-state media. Nina is a town of patriots and pickups, a town of 5,000 in the mountains of western Arkansas, a place that would seem as far away from American foreign policy as a place could get. And yet, one little airport on the southern edge of town is managing to raise questions that extend far beyond the city limits. A thousand miles away from Mena, here in Washington, there are investigators for both the House and the Senate who would like to know what's going on at that little airport in western Arkansas. As Oliver North's public battle over government secrets and the illegal supply of weapons to the Nicaraguan Contras is waged in Washington, congressional investigators in recent months have tried to learn if Mena, Arkansas was an illegal staging area for shipping guns to the U.S.-backed Contra rebels. This is a strange story. The facts already known are bizarre enough. What Unit 5 has been able to learn makes this story stranger still. It all begins in 1982, when this man, Adler Berryman Seal, showed up in Mena, Arkansas. My top load paid me one and a half million dollars for a single trip. Barry Seal was a drug smuggler, an extraordinary multi-million dollar a year drug smuggler, who with the help of several associates, kept and serviced his drug planes in a hangar at the Mena airport. Those planes, according to investigators, were illegally modified with extra fuel tanks and instruments in order to fly long-distance drug missions to Central and South America. Barry Seal paid his associates for those modifications with tens of thousands of dollars in cash, money which, according to investigators, was illegally laundered by Seal's associates at banks in Mina. Yeah, I'm pleading guilty. But when Barry Seal was finally caught in 1984, investigators for the FBI, the IRS, and other agencies of law enforcement were told little or nothing about a special deal he had made with the Federal Drug Task Force headed by then Vice President George Bush. The deal? The government kept Barry Seal out of jail, and in exchange, Seal became a drug informant and helped put in jail some of his own associates in the international drug trade. But that wasn't all that Barry Seal did. Russell Welch, criminal investigator for the Arkansas State Police. Did Barry Seal ever say to you, I work for the CIA? He said he was working, had worked for the CIA. Unit 5 has learned in the early 1980s, even before his arrest, Seal had bought one of his planes from a CIA front, Air America. The plane was used by Seal for drug smuggling, and the CIA company was paid in the traditional drug dealer fashion of $300,000 in cash. According to this confidential FBI teletype obtained by Unit 5, one of SEAL's associates said he was maintaining SEAL's aircraft at the MENA airport for the CIA. So what was Barry SEAL actually doing? One federal agent under uh, very uh, strict confidence told me that it was assumed within his agency Barry SEAL was uh, carrying guns to Central America in exchange, was bringing drugs back on a free ride. Russell Welch of the Arkansas State Police was one of dozens of investigators who for years had been tracking Barry Seal and his associates. As these documents obtained by Unit 5 indicate, the FBI, the IRS, Customs, and the Attorney General of Louisiana formed just a partial list of those who wanted some answers. They didn't get them. Internal FBI documents indicate investigators were told not to look into any of Seal's activities that occurred before his 1984 plea agreement. So, blocked from seeking indictments against SEAL, investigators sought indictments against SEAL's associates at the MENA airport for allegedly aiding in the drug smuggling and for alleged IRS violations. So far, no indictments have been produced. At the end of this year, the statute of limitations will run out on those alleged crimes. As for Barry SEAL, time ran out in 1986 when he was assassinated in Louisiana by Colombian drug dealers. 
Some of Seal's secrets died with him. But some of those secrets today remain guarded by the National Security Council, the agency for which Oliver North worked. The NSC has blocked a recent congressional request to examine the relationship of drug smuggling to American foreign policy in Central America. As a citizen, America didn't get to stay in court. A Chicago journalist Carol Moran unearthed a whole new facet of the MENA operation. As her investigation continued, she connected the dots from MENA to Washington and discovered that a major portion of Oliver North's Contra assistance program took place in a wooded, mountainous region north of the MENA airport. Watch part two of Marin's special. Angola, where the United States has supported rebels against the Marxist government. South Africa, where the United States has walked a tightrope between the minority white government and the majority black population. Central America, where the United States has tried to overthrow the leftist government of Nicaragua and prop up the centrist government of El Salvador. Three critical areas for U.S. foreign policy that seem very distant from the concerns of a small community in western Arkansas, but maybe not. Mena, Arkansas is a small town in the mountains along the Arkansas-Oklahoma border. It has no interstate highway. It takes some effort to get here. But some people, some very interesting people in recent years, apparently made that effort. I don't think that there's really anything that we can pin down about them. I believe there's truth in every story. The rumors and gossip surround two small airfields. The first is the Mena Airport, where this giant C-130 military cargo plane Tail number N4469P arrived one day last year. It is a huge plane for a small airport, a plane that originally belonged to the Royal Australian Air Force. Curiously, around the same time, a group of Australians arrived to work at the airport, telling investigators like Russell Welch of the Arkansas State Police some strange things. You've spoken with some of the Australians at the airport, correct? Yes. And some of them have told you they're part of a CIA operation. Yes, it didn't seem to be too much of a secret. An Australian at that time told Welch the C-130 would soon be on its way to Angola, mission undisclosed. Unit 5 has learned of two current federal probes at the airport. U.S. Customs in Houston is investigating possible violations of the Neutrality Act, whether or not this plane, considered to be a weapon of war, might be on its way into the hands of South Africa. The second investigation by Arkansas Congressman Bill Alexander probes, among other things, whether or not the CIA within the past year and a half contracted with various partners to transport arms to Central America, allowing them to bring drugs back to MENA with distribution in Miami or New York. The mayor of MENA, Jerry Montgomery, doesn't believe any of it. That's hard for me to believe that, that MENA, Arkansas was used. But there's more, down a winding dirt road, back in the mountains where even the locals can get lost, resides yet another mystery. Now this landing strip is a curious thing. It exists in an isolated mountain valley in the middle of nowhere when there already is an airport just 11 miles from here. So why was 2,700 feet of runway installed here? Why was this landing strip built and what was it built for? One person who thinks he knows the answer is Gene Wheaton, a former criminal investigator for the U.S. Army who has done his own investigation. They were training pilots to make night flights and takeoffs and landings of strips that had no lighting, no air control, so forth. Wheaton's deposition came last year in an unsuccessful civil lawsuit against Oliver North and other principals in the Iran-Contra scandal. Oliver North won that battle and now in Washington fights the criminal charges against him. It is a fight over what government secrets should stay secret. In some ways, on a smaller scale, that's the same battle going on in Mena, Arkansas, where investigators from a variety of agencies for a number of years have asked questions of the government and have received few answers. The people of MENA themselves continue to debate whether or not their small town has some ongoing role in American foreign policy. I don't uh, see how it could have been kept a secret. There are definitely fishy things going on, and, and there's a lot of uh, cover-up. So, in the mid to late 1980s, news of the MENA connection spilled forth. 
This may lead one to wonder if the media simply dropped the MENA story after the aftermath of the Iran-Contra scandal died down. Quite the opposite. Time and time again, the story would leap into the headlines of predominantly Arkansas newspapers. Arkansas journalists, law enforcement officials, and citizens groups would try in vain to advance the investigations, but an invisible force seemed to be keeping the lid on Arkansas's Pandora's box. Then, in 1992, during the presidential campaign, after the name of Bill Clinton was thrust into the mainstream media, a renewed interest in MENA surfaced as throngs of journalists rushed to Little Rock to investigate the obscure young governor who was seeking the Democratic Party's nomination. Countless reporters dug, probed, and pried into the layers of lies, deceit, and distortions that by then effectively interred MENA's dark secrets. Russell Welch of the Arkansas State Police and Bill Duncan, by then an investigator with the Arkansas Attorney General's office, were interviewed time and time again as the media slowly began to understand that a large-scale, high-profile CIA operation had in fact taken place on Arkansas soil on Bill Clinton's watch as governor. Arkansas Democratic Congressman Bill Alexander renewed his efforts to get the truth out. The truth that even he had been stonewalled as his office attempted to dissect the MENA story. Then, in April of 1992, as the pressure cooker containing the MENA scandal seemed ready to burst, with the resulting steam most assuredly scalding Bill Clinton and destroying his political career, Time magazine came to the rescue. Time's full-page story which savagely attacked the credibility of Terry Reid and ridiculed nearly everyone associated with the MENA investigation, effectively nailed the lid once again on the CIA's box of dirty secrets. What the Time article failed to tell the reader, however, was Time's investigative journalist Richard Behar, who wrote the story Anatomy of a Smear, was actually in Arkansas helping to undermine the investigative efforts of other credible journalists. Behar had discovered that the news magazine The Nation was actually corroborating portions of Terry Reid's story concerning weapons parts manufacturing. Through a liable suit in federal court launched by Terry Reid against Time magazine, the following tape-recorded conversation was obtained. In it, Behar is conversing with Bill Clinton's friend Webster Hubble, who was then working with Hillary Clinton at the Rose Law Firm in Little Rock. In the tape, Behar is alerting Hubble of an active media investigation into Hubble's father-in-law's manufacturing company, P.O.M., in Russellville, Arkansas. Behar is warning Hubble that his brother-in-law, Skeeter Ward, is divulging classified information to the magazine The Nation. Remember, according to CIA insider Terry Reid, it was P.O.M. on the surface a manufacturer of parking meters who was building weapons parts for the CIA through an agreement with Ivers Johnson Firearms, a CIA proprietary company situated in Jacksonville, Arkansas. Well, listen, can I, can I make a recommendation to you off the record? Sure. Um, and this is, I, I don't particularly want these guys to know that I'm on this story, uh -huh. but it seems to me they're acting a little irresponsibly. The Nation newspaper? Uh-huh. Apparently, I heard it through the grapevine, they had an interview with Skeeter. Uh-huh. And, shouldn't be talking to them. And supposedly, Skeeter told them that you guys have done exit cones on nuclear weapons. At POM. Which he, he wouldn't have said that. He knows better. Well, that's just the thing. Yeah. I don't know why it would come back to me through different channels that have nuclear weapons. Yeah. Unless the story's taking a life of its own. Yeah. What you may want to do is give a ring to the nation. Yeah. And and speak to whoever's doing the story and clear it up before they put it in their damn newspaper. Yeah. Yeah. But you didn't hear it from me. I appreciate it. I really do. So why did Time magazine use its vast resources to protect Bill Clinton? Maybe the fact that Bill Clinton's friend and former Oxford roommate, 
Strobe Talbot, who was then Time's editor-at-large, played a role. Did Mr. Talbot receive a reward for short-circuiting the investigation? The perception is certainly there. Mr. Talbot joined the Clinton administration in 1993 and is now the number two man in the Department of State. Is it possible that an organization that's perceived as credible as Time magazine is in effect under the control of the CIA? A CIA investigator supplying sworn testimony for the Reed versus Time liable suit after being asked to evaluate Time's article on MENA said in an affidavit he believed the article was an obvious disinformation tool. So, with Time magazine's help, it appeared that MENA would die and the truth would never come out. But the government had underestimated the determination of Terry Reed. Terry and his wife Janice were seeking complete vindication in federal court in Little Rock as a result of being the victims of a manufactured crime. Although silenced and gagged within the federal court system for nearly two and a half years, the Reeds emerged victorious. Terry was acquitted of all charges by a federal judge in Wichita, Kansas, charges involving the theft of an airplane, and Janice's case was eventually dropped. But they both wanted to see those who had needlessly ensnared them in the manufactured crime brought to justice. The Reeds and their attorneys saw this blatant misuse of the criminal justice system being used solely as a way to destroy their credibility, thus insulating important politicians from the MENA scandal. The Reeds had filed a civil rights lawsuit in July 1991 against Bill Clinton's chief of security, Arkansas State Police Captain Raymond Buddy Young. It was quite obvious from the court record that Young, working in concert with others, had helped to orchestrate the wrongful criminal indictment brought against them. Terry knew that properly trying the civil rights case would require reopening the entire MENA story. Power brokers of both political parties were desperate to ensure this didn't happen. As the Reed case simmered in a court file in Little Rock, the media was beginning to probe into the financial dealings of Bill and Hillary Clinton and their friends. By early 1994, a new term, Whitewater, would consume the headlines and refocus the media's attention to Arkansas. And this time, reporters would attempt to better explain Bill Clinton's meteoric rise to power. Once again, that four-letter word, M-E-N-A, would resurface. This time, the media would be armed with the information detailed in Terry Reed's book, Compromised. The reporters were beginning to notice a shocking similarity between the players of the MENA story and those of the Whitewater scandal. The connection Reed had made between people involved with the CIA's enterprise and some very prominent Arkansans caused CBS News to do an eight-minute story on the scandal that just won't go away. A civil war in Central America, drug smuggling in Arkansas, President Ronald Reagan and President Bill Clinton, the subject of tonight's Eye on America. But first, a little background. In the early 80s, a war was underway for control of Nicaragua. On one side, the ruling Marxist regime, the Sandinistas. On the other side, rebel forces, the Contras, labeled by the Reagan administration as pro-democracy freedom fighters. A base of support for the Contra movement, remote western Arkansas. Correspondent Bill Plant has been investigating for tonight's Eye on America. 1983, Ronald Reagan was president, Bill Clinton was governor, and little Mina, Arkansas, changed from a quiet town to a center for drug smuggling and reported Contra support activity. In the middle of it all, this man, admitted dope smuggler Barry Seal. He started doing business with the Ochoa family in Columbia, hauling his uh, dope. Arkansas State Trooper Russell Welch investigated SEAL's organization. Each trip would have uh, 250 to 350 pounds of cocaine. Uh, he stated that he made a uh, uh, million dollars in one trip alone. SEAL built this hangar at Rich Mountain Aviation at the MENA Airport for his high-tech smuggling planes used to fly guns to the Contras and more than 20 tons of cocaine into the U.S. over three and a half years. 
Former IRS agent William Duncan traced some of Seal's drug profits laundered through MENA banks. We had direct testimony from people who were involved in the money laundering operation. We had testimony from people at banks who observed the transactions. And Barry Seal had another agenda. Pilot Terry Reed claims Seal hired him in 1983 to train Contra pilots at this remote airstrip north of MENA. I was involved in the flight training aspects of upgrading Nicaraguan uh, freedom fighters to make them uh, capable of flying combat aircraft. The airstrip was built by SEAL's organization and also reportedly used to train Contra ground troops. In 1984, SEAL was arrested for smuggling and was turned by the Drug Enforcement Administration into an informant and smuggler for the government. With help from both Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North and the CIA, SEAL pulled off a spectacular drug sting. He flew his own C-123 to Nicaragua, where he took these pictures of Sandinistas helping load Colombian cocaine onto his plane. After the sting, SEAL flew the C-123 to the MENA airport, where it sat for a year. It was later shot down over Nicaragua, filled with guns for the Contras. By late 1985, Agent Duncan had gathered substantial evidence of alleged money laundering against SEAL's associates Fred Hampton and Joe Evans of Rich Mountain Aviation. What happened when you tried to make this case before a grand jury? I was never asked to present the evidence to a grand jury, ever. The evidence was in this 24-count draft indictment prepared for the federal grand jury in January of 1986, but the grand jury never saw it. The United States Department of Justice did not pursue the cases, did not present the evidence of money laundering to the grand jury. Former U.S. Attorney Mike Fitzhugh, who handled the MENA cases, says that was because Agent Duncan asked for a delay. I consented to his request that, uh, uh, that the matter not be presented at the grand jury session meeting in January of 86. Agent Duncan says he made no such request. That is absolutely false. An FBI internal memo from early February 1986 obtained by CBS News says Fitzhugh was withholding presentation of the indictment, but there is no mention of a request from IRS agent Duncan for a delay. I would have been the last person in the world to have tried to delay evidence going to the grand jury. We asked attorney Fitzhugh if he was told to delay the indictment by the Reagan Justice Department. There was not any type of pressure or influence uh, put on, on me or anyone in my office that I'm aware of. For two more years, Trooper Welch watched as Fitzhugh's federal grand jury failed to return indictments in the MENA cases. It was a slow realization uh, over a period of time that, no, the, this isn't like any other case. Uh, it's not going anywhere. Uh, we're, uh, we are wasting our time. By 1988, Trooper Welch and Agent Duncan had given up on the Reagan Justice Department, but not on their investigation. They had hopes that the state of Arkansas could impanel a grand jury to hear evidence of money laundering, drug smuggling, and conspiracy. They went directly to then-Governor Bill Clinton. That part of the story in a moment. Back now with more of our Eye on America investigation of drugs, guns, and money laundering in Arkansas in the 1980s. By 1988, law enforcement officials investigating the case had given up on the federal government, pinning their hopes for prosecution on the state judicial system. Correspondent Bill Plant picks up the story from there. By 1988, almost everyone in Arkansas had heard about MENA. It was here at Rich Mountain Aviation that authorities believed Barry Seal moved his operation. There were news reports about smuggling and Contra support activity around the MENA airport. Congress had begun an inquiry, and the media covered it all. At the Polk County Courthouse in MENA, Trooper Welch and Agent Duncan turned to County Prosecutor Charles Black for help. And when it became apparent that uh, nothing was going to be done on the federal level, that's when I began more actively pursuing it. Prosecutor Black, a Clinton supporter, met with the governor and handed him a letter requesting money for a state grand jury on MENA. His response to me was that he would... Uh, uh, get a man something to the effect that he would get a man on it and would get word back to me and uh, i never heard back years later clinton said he offered twenty five thousand dollars to prosecutor black's boss to fund a grand jury but charles black and his boss claim they never heard about any offer of money from governor clinton 
I believe Bill Clinton's an honest, respectable man, and uh, I have to believe that he did that. But the fact is, I never got that word myself. But the MENA issue would not die. I don't think that the story of Iran-Contra has yet been fully told. In 1988, Arkansas Congressman Bill Alexander asked the General Accounting Office to investigate connections between the MENA airport, Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North's Contra operations, and Panamanian dictator Manuel Noriega. Alexander says the National Security Council, in this letter, refused to cooperate, challenging GAO's authority, and effectively killing the investigation. Then MENA became an issue in the 1990 Attorney General's race in Arkansas, between Republican Asa Hutchinson and Democrat Winston Bryant. Sources tell CBS News that Governor Clinton's aide, Betsy Wright, asked Bryant to stay away from the MENA issue. Wright denies it. In 1991, Congressman Alexander got the Arkansas State Police a federal grant to reopen the MENA investigation. Sources tell CBS News that Governor Clinton's staff was involved in the discussions about what to do with that grant. The money went to state police chief Tommy Goodwin. That money was discussed around here for quite a while, <laughs> and, and we finally said, we'll just turn it back. We don't have anything to, to spend it on. Well, what happened to the state case? Nothing happened to the state case. A grand jury was never called. Uh, uh, it, just, it just died. I maintained uh, a certain amount of faith that at some point the problem would be solved. That never occurred. Has not occurred. Has yet. not occurred to this day. Barry Seal's organization helped the Contras, smuggled tons of cocaine, and laundered drug profits through Arkansas. Why did the Reagan Justice Department fail to prosecute? Did Bill Clinton, then the governor, fail to provide leadership and support for a successful state prosecution? The White House says he did all he could. But Agent Duncan, Trooper Welts, Prosecutor Black, and a lot of other people are still looking for answers. In Washington, this is Bill Plant for Eye on America.